Uh, nice to have you all here. Um, after all the more difficult subjects of futures, streaming and everything, we now have a bit of a more simple subject, a bit more fun probably as well, um, with a bit of Lego. Um, my name is Jan Janssen. I don't work for Lego myself. I would have wanted to, but um, luckily enough, my company Infosport also gave me some time to play with Lego, so that's not bad either. Um, my Twitter handle, in case you have any questions or want to contact me. Um, and of course, if you like the session, please rate it. If you don't like it, complain to your neighbor. Um, so no Lego was harmed. Some Raspberry Pis died during the project, but everybody has those lying around, right? But first, let me ask a question. Please raise your hand if you already have a Raspberry Pi. Keep the hand in the air if it's collecting dust somewhere. OK, quite some people. Um, how many people have played with Lego when they were younger? OK, OK, so now you have, after this session, you know what to do with your Raspberry Pi. I won't ask you if you still play with Lego. Maybe some people will feel embarrassed by it. I play with Lego, but I was forced by my employer, of course. I didn't want to. Um, so these are a bit the content for today. If you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me and I'll try to answer the question immediately. First, why? I mean, we had a, a few different reasons uh, to start with this project. Uh, one of the reasons was we wanted to invest if we could use the same languages and tools and frameworks uh, that we used to build enterprise software on big servers on IoT hardware like a Raspberry Pi. So run Java, run Scala on a Raspberry Pi with all the frameworks around it. We wanted to test if the resources of the Raspberry Pi were enough for that. And next to that, we, of course, we, we just wanted to do something fun, try out new stuff. And I mean, you can write Hello World, but that gets boring after a while. So we thought, why not use a bit of hardware, play with hardware, use that Raspberry Pi that was already collecting dust. Um, and I think it's a nice way to visualize stuff and to explain stuff to people that aren't that, aren't that technical. I mean, if I try to explain to my wife what an event-driven architecture is, and I say that message M is sent from system X to system Y, then probably she would have stopped listening at event-driven. And um, that's not her fault. I mean, we just speak some alien dialect that nobody else understands. Uh, but if we explain it in another way and we say, OK, I send a message to my train, uh, where in the message I say which file I want to play, which music file I want to play, and then the train will play that song. That's understandable for probably everyone. Um, so it makes it easier also to explain to kids what programming is all about, and then it can be a lot of fun. But beware, I mean, once you get started, your room quickly ends up like this, or in the end, my entire room was filled with a couple of these uh, setups. So, but it's fun. And, and the nice thing is, it, it doesn't have to be expensive to get started. I mean, I, I just understood that most of you already have a Raspberry Pi. So then you only have to spend like 25 bucks to get like a Wi-Fi dongle, a, a battery pack, and an infrared transmitter. And later on, we'll see how we use those items. Um, but you can go further and keep on adding stuff to it. So this one, at the right, it has a speaker, because you need train sounds, of course. Uh, it has a camera, so I have a live feed of the train running on the track. So when I'm at work, of course, only during lunch breaks, on my mobile phone, I can see where the train is running. So if my wife tries to mess with it, I can see it. Um, and underneath it, uh, you can see it a bit here, there is an um, RFID reader. So I can determine the position on the track. So you can keep on adding stuff to it. And that's the nice thing of the Raspberry Pi. It's you have lots of possibilities there. Um, I mean, when we began, we began with a simple Raspberry Pi. I think it was the B plus that was available then. Uh, but the B plus is quite big to put in a Lego train. So in the end, we ended up with a Raspberry Pi A plus, which isn't really quick, but it's quick enough to run Java or Scala on it. And the, the most um, difficult part is the memory. Uh, when we run all the applications on it, I sometimes notice that the memory was getting a bit low. Um, but if you would use neural models or, or Raspberry Pi 2 models, then there is more than enough hardware. But the problem is, they, as you can see here, they consume a lot more uh, power. And we have a battery pack, so if we consume less power, we can run longer with the trains. And of course, that's what you want. Um, Architecture-wise, uh, we started with like an ancient technology. I 
find it difficult to mention it here, but we used Java. Um, so we started with an application with an Angular front end. Uh, LTCC stands for Lego Train Control Center. Really innovative name, of course. Uh, we had a Java backend that was running on my laptop as well. Um, and that connected to device control, which was running on the Raspberry Pi on the trains or on the Ferris wheels, we will see later. And we had a switch control, which controlled the switches. Communication went with REST, as you can see here. And underneath, we used some, stand -up, uh, some libraries that were already available. So instead of writing our own Java components to access the hardware, we used some stuff with, which was written in C or in Python, adjusted it a bit to our needs, and then used Java as the integration layer, more or less. And that worked perfectly fine, but after a while, we did some Scala and Akka courses, and we were quite excited with it, but well, we wanted to have a bit of a use case to play around with it, so we decided, okay, just throw away all the Java stuff and build it again in, in Scala and Akka. So now, we still have a REST interface, of course, for Angular. I mean, you cannot access Akka components directly from Angular, so you need some kind of a REST interface. And here we have a REST interface because the RFID components, uh, they call to a REST interface. But between the Raspberry Pi and this, uh, the laptop, in my case, everything is run with remote actors. So the remote actors, they talk to each other. And then it looks like this. Um, in the beginning, we did everything wireless, which worked perfectly fine at home until we did it at a conference and it was quite shaky because you have lots of other Wi-Fi points uh, uh, running around. So we decided to put everything that was possible on a cable, except for the trains, of course, because it looks quite silly if you have a cable running after your train. Um, and it all runs with uh, uh, the router that's, that's running here. Um, so with the router, we connect to the wireless adapters that are in the, in the trains or in the Raspberry Pis. And the Raspberry Pi has an infrared transmitter that sends signals to the infrared receiver from Lego. So that's quite a nice way. That way we didn't have to fiddle with the engines or break open some Lego components because then the, the Lego uh, fans will hit you quite hard if you break with Lego or glue Lego or they don't like that. So I try to not mess with them. Um, if you have it standard, it, it I mean, Probably if you are, are as old as I am, you've had the older Lego trains which were controlled by direct power, not so many batteries as they use now. Nowadays they have a remote control with some batteries inside it. Uh, there is a battery pack inside it, so this one. Uh, this is the same in the train. Then we have some engines at the bottom. These are a bit different than the ones in the train. The train is directly uh, driving uh, uh, the wheels of the train. And at the back, we have the infrared receiver. So what we can do then is we can easily move around if everything works. Yeah. So this is the same as the train when we first got it, more or less. And that works quite cool until you have a bit of a longer track. For instance, when I did it in my living room and, and drove the train to my kitchen, and it's just an apartment, not a, a big villa or something like that. Um, when I reached the, the kitchen and wanted to stop the train, I was already, the infrared wasn't working anymore and my train just collapsed into the kitchen. Well, which is fun now and, uh, so now and then, but it takes some time to build it up again. Um, so this solution makes sure that you can, yeah, just wherever you have Wi-Fi, you can just connect the trains and send signals to it. And the other cool thing is here, you only can have a few channels, so you can only control a few trains. With the Wi-Fi setup, you can virtually control an unlimited number of trains. So that's what you want, right? And it looks really simple. This is the basics that you need. It's an infrared transmitter, really cheap, uh, and a Wi-Fi adapter connected to a Raspberry Pi A plus model. And that way, you can already get started. Well, we can do some sound where we just use uh, MPEG-1 to trade uh, the Linux library to play sounds. Uh, we've got RFID, so we lay a few of these, which are R RFID tags, around on the track, and each of the tags corresponds to a location um, on the track, more or less. So here, I think it's number two, corresponds to the cow. And that way, we can determine where the train is. Um, of course, you also want live camera feed to see if your cat is in the way or uh, whatever. Um, that was actually quite difficult camera feeds uh, to get them 
in a good quality, uh, available on multiple platforms, and without lots of delay is, is a difficult thing. Um, most of the times you either have some proprietary solution which only works with VLC, or you have a delay of like five seconds, and five seconds is way too long because then I cannot control my train properly when I'm at work. Um, so I, I kept looking for a solution, and then luckily I, I found this one, RPI cam control. If you ever do anything with your dusty Raspberry Pi with a camera, look at this library. It's, it's really nice. What they do is they don't transmit video, they just transmit pictures and just refresh pictures really quickly. You won't notice it if I wouldn't tell you, but it works a lot better. And then you can get, it's, it's a little delay what you have, but it, it's quite uh, working well. Um, next to that, we also automated track switches to make sure we, when we have multiple tracks, we could switch the trains. I didn't brought them because it's a bit much to bring everything uh, uh, on a plane, uh, and customs will not uh, like that as much. Um, but here there is just some servos inside uh, and a special servo board for the Raspberry Pi so that we can control up to 16 servos at a time. Uh, we, we managed to make some paper clips exactly the right length. I think these four paper clips are the most expensive ones in the world because with three colleagues, we spend an afternoon making these. Uh, if you make them a bit too long, it doesn't work. If you make them a bit too short, it doesn't work either. So yeah, it was a bit frustrating afternoon. But if it works, it's cool. Um, and then, I mean, trains are cool, but I mean, I saw the Ferris wheel and it was cool, man. Let's automate this one. It's even bigger. Um, but then, yeah, man, how do you automate it? And actually, it turned out it's, it was rather easy. Um, I see a bit of the picture on the right is falling away. Um, but what you cannot see here is that the same infrared receiver as Wally has on its back, so this one, um, is also connected to the Ferris wheel with more or less the same engine as Wally has. So actually, I could just use the same code I was using to drive the trains to control the Ferris wheel. So that was uh, yeah, rather quickly set up except for spending like a day to build the Ferris wheel, but that's fun, right? I mean, work. <laughs> um, after that, we are, okay, wh what can we do more? And of course, every IoT project has to have something with LEDs. Um, so I looked around and found these nice things, uh, these NeoPixel rings, so you can buy them in various sizes, um, and a, a LED uh, strip, which you can see at the front. But to use a Raspberry Pi with it, it feels a bit like overkill. So I looked at a bit of different hardware, and I found these particle photons. And you cannot run Scala on it, which is a bit unfortunately, because they're a bit limited for resources. But if you want to do something with IoT, I can really advise you to look into it. And the cool thing of these devices is that there is a Wi-Fi chip on board. Uh, they only cost like 25 bucks. And if you power them up, you just connect with your uh, mobile device to it. Uh, you enter your credentials of your router, and directly the photon will connect to the particle cloud. And the particle cloud then offers a solution where you can just program in the cloud, and then you can say, okay, this is my photon, flash this photon, and then the code will be flashed on the photon. You can then send REST commands from your laptop to the cloud to the photon. So that's really nicely integrated with the cloud. Um, for conferences, it's a bit difficult because Wi-Fi is often shaky. So in the end, we just made a local cloud on my laptop so that we weren't dependent on the, uh, the cloud they were offering themselves. Uh, I heard from colleagues that nowadays they even have special firmware, which makes it really easy to set up like local photons that don't need the cloud. But it's a nice way uh, of, of working with, with these kinds of hardware. And actually, it's, the programming is the same as for an Arduino. So it's, it's quickly to... to get up and running. Okay, but you all, of course, are waiting for the demo to fail. Um, <laughs> so let's see. I mean, all other speakers always say, like, ah, demos are easy, they always go well. So we thought, let's add some extra stuff to it and see if it still works. Um, so here we're just running in manual mode, so I can just control the trains and they will move up and forth around the track. Um, and not really well, of course, something has to fail. Stuck on the truck. Ah, okay. Ah, good point. <laughs> so 
So what you see is the trains are running. And at the bottom here, you can see where the blue train is. So now it says it's at the car. And now it says it's at the bicycle. So quite simple. It, it works as long as the train isn't moving too fast and, and the RFID reader isn't too far away. Um, I can see the blue train is having some issues again, so I'll, I'll stop him for a mi minute. Um, and also, of course, uh, it, it should now display some songs. Ah, yeah. It also works if you have people want, wanting to try to break into your home. You can scare them away with it. Uh. <laughs> or, or with the train, yeah. They probably won't expect moving trains when they break into a home. Um, so these are the, the ones at the top are actually for the track switches, which I uh, couldn't bring, unfortunately. And here you see the live camera feed of the camera that's laying here. The camera feed of the train we had to disable because it's sometimes a bit shaky, and if it's, it's a bit shaky, then other commands that I send to the train are interrupted as well. So it's a bit tricky to do it at conferences. At home, I promise it works, but at conferences, to safety first, and, and just <laughs> make sure it works. Um, so also, sh I mean, this is manual mode. We can also do a bit of automation with it. So we can say, if the blue train is at the bicycle, then the white train should move at speed minus three to, uh, yeah, minus three. And if we, uh, the, the blue train is at the cow, then we go with speed three. I just enter a few. Uh, crossing, and then the last one. Yeah, something else, five. Uh, car, uh, car. Uh, so now we started like, oh. Oh, he's already at the bicycle, I think, now, the, the cow. Uh, let's open it in an, on another window. He's at the car, and at the car we said it should move at speed five. So that's working. Now let's see if we can get the blue train moving again. Uh, not completely what I wanted, but... Let's just do it like this. <laughs> Up again. And now it will move the other direction. So that's a bit of, of stuff we can fiddle around with. And if correct, at the LEDs, you can see the speed the train is moving at. Uh, not completely correct, I see. Wait a second, I didn't uh, enable that yet. Um, so we can just say that if the speed changes by autopilot or by manual, uh, it should show that speed. So now, uh, wait, first reset the autopilot. So now it should show speed four somewhere. So you see four LEDs moving. And if we put the other train on, uh, let's say, negative speed. Nah, it doesn't like me anymore. Ah, wait, it's a bit messed up. Sometimes you have to help it a bit. So now you probably see some LEDs moving backwards uh, somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Cannot see anything there, so that's a bit more difficult. So that's more or less what the, what the trains uh, can do. Um, so yeah, we implemented it with actors to make sure that everybody's on the same page, probably. Lots of you have already used actors, but it simply works like this. Uh, we can say that we have a worker actor, and when we um, receive something, in this case, if we receive anything, we just print that anything. And we can simply uh, create a system and create an, the reference to the actor, and we can just send it a string, hello conference, and it will print that string. Of course, sending strings around isn't the best practice, but um, this is just a simple example. If we don't then want to do remote actors, so local actors, they just run within one JVM. That's really cool. One machine, lots of local actors, and just playing around. But we wanted to have actors running on the Raspberry Pi and let them communicate with the actors running on my laptop. Uh, so that's a bit further away. Um, but actually, that's, that's quite easy. Instead of what we say here, we want an actor, uh, a worker actor. Um, 
we here say, okay, give us the actor that's, that's on the remote system, where we just specify the actor system, IP address, port, and the actor that we want. And of course, you can abstract this in some configuration file or something like that, but this is just a simple example. Um, and to make remote actors work, you just have to copy paste a bit of configuration and you're ready to go. Um, one thing to keep in mind, um, at first for us it was a bit getting used to, but when you send messages around from one actor on one JVM to another actor on another JVM, of course both uh, JVMs need to know that message. Um, so for instance, if we send a play message from the actor on the laptop to the music service actor on the Raspberry Pi, uh, that message has to be known on both sides. So we define like a message protocol, which is more or less a library we include in, on both sides of the, uh, of the applications. Uh, it's as simple as this. Uh, we can just send a play command or we can ask a list uh, of all the files that are available to play. And then we can simply use the package name and, and use that to communicate. So that's a bit uh, the new way of communication we used. We started with REST and then started using this one. And we really liked it and we had the idea it was faster, but we didn't measure it on the, on the trains because it's a bit difficult with network and, and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can say it's nicer, but you, I, I don't have blue eyes, so it's difficult to believe me on that. Um, so we were like, okay, what things can we measure to really say that it's better, or better in some cases at least? And so we were looking into that. Uh, well, first some advantages, disadvantages of the, the different subjects. I mean, using remote actors, it saves you from converting stuff to JSON and creating JSON endpoints and everything. It's, it's just the same actor which you use locally, you can use it also remotely. There's, you don't need to do much to do that. And that feels much more natural. I mean, you don't want to be bothered with communication protocols between different systems. It's just you want to do something. And I think remote actors are better for that. And they have some extra features like load balancing. Um, but HTTP also has its advantages. It's more independent of technology. You can use it with any language more or less. And it's more loosely coupled. Although in practice in companies where I work for, most of the times when we wanted to change something, we needed to change both server and client. So yeah, I always find it a bit difficult to say that it's really loosely coupled. I mean, often if you change something, you need to change everything anyway. Um, but for some hard measures, we started measuring the size of the, uh, the fat jar, so including all the libraries we need. And we saw that with local actors, it's like eight megabytes. With remote actors, it's like 11, 12 megabytes. And as soon as you add HTTP, it's like 10 megabytes extra or something like that. So that's not really what you, what you want. Uh, for reference, I also included Spring Boot. That's already uh, a lot less. Maybe with the new uh, HTTP version, it's also optimized. I, I didn't uh, uh, count that yet. So it's, yeah, it, it's fairly similar to Spring Boot uh, and at least a bit smaller than HTTP. Uh, next to that, we're like, OK, let's do some Gatling, some performance testing. Um, and we more or less executed this script, so simply just do some ping pong, some simple, more hello world-ish uh, application and see how it performs. And we did some tests with a pause between it and we did the same test without a pause between it. And we did every test three times and took the average of those tests. So that's to make it a bit nicely. I mean, it's not a scientific test, but we try to be as, uh, as good as possible with it. So how does it look like in both uh, scenarios? So we have two scenarios, the one at the top. Um, we have ACA HTTP on JVM1, and then we do an ACA HTTP call on another JVM. And in the second scenario, we do a call from this JVM to a remote actor. So we compare remote actors with ACA HTTP, more or less. And it gave these results. So this is with 50 users, and this is with 50 users, no pause, etc. Mm, it's a bit hard to see here, um, but this is the end of the bar, so it's, it's a lot less. Remote actors perform a lot better with mean response time in milliseconds in this case. Um, and, and then we look at the max response times and still remote actors work much faster than, uh, than using ACA HTTP. Same for 99 percentile, also a lot better. Um, and I didn't only do these tests, I also had a graduation student that did his own tests. 
uh, and made his own example to test this. And he found out that in his example, REST could ha handle around 600 users. And Akka, yeah, he stopped measuring at 1,000 users, but he estimated that the Akka remote actor solution could handle 3,300 users. So that's five times as much users with the same hardware. I mean, that's also a, a good selling point, I think, for management. Um, so then we're ready, right? <laughs> Please, if you do a presentation, include it, because it's popular nowadays to have your own law, like Conway's law, so I'm waiting for someone to include my uh, <laughs> law. Um, but then it was okay. Let's compare it with Spring Boot. <laughs> uh, luckily, finally, some audience that understands the joke. Uh, Actually, none of my colleagues got it, so I was really disappointed with it. But <laughs> luckily, you are smarter than my colleagues. <laughs> um, so we compared, we did more or less the same tests, and then now the blue bar is Spring Boot. And it was a bit disappointing. Because Spring Boot seemed to be faster than Remote Actor. So that was like, ah, man. Um, not so nice. The same for, uh, but for max response times, so we saw that Remote actors were much more stable, uh, especially if you see it on the, on the right. Uh, a bit difficult to do. But this is for remote actors, and, and this is Spring Boot. So I mean, maybe the, the normal response times are slower, but the max response times are much more stable with uh, remote actors. And that's also the reason that for 99 percentile, it's also better. Uh, by the way, this one before you ask a question about it, it's a measurement error. Uh, we did three test runs, and one test run showed really high values, but I thought I, I could exclude it f from the results, but then I was fiddling with results, and I'd rather just show the real stuff, uh, because, I mean, don't trust results you didn't falsify yourself. <laughs> um, yeah, this is not my house, because if I had such a house, I probably would have good insurance as well. Um, <laughs> But there were some challenges. I mean, my house didn't burn down, but I actually burned down a Raspberry Pi. Um, yeah, luckily you can just replace them if you have a, a nice dealer or buy a new one because they're actually quite cheap. So that, that's quite nice. And for resources, uh, although Raspberry Pis are picking up and, and getting quicker and getting more resources, the A plus model which we used was still quite a bit limited, and we reached the maximum of, of memory we could use. So it's working, but you cannot run like really advanced applications on it. It's, it's nice for, for playing around like this, um, but doing heavy Java or Scala stuff on it will probably not work. Um, if you ever buy a Raspberry Pi A+, and you want to put some USB device inside it, uh, so uh, in this one, I think, um, be really careful. They have like connectors with, if you put the USB device in it, they have some pins that keep it in place. But in the A plus model, they made those really cheap. And if you have a bit of a thicker USB device, uh, you put them against the pins and the pins bend backward and you lose another Raspberry Pi. Um, I only found out after the third one was broken. So that was a bit of a pity. Uh, because my, f my first B plus model worked perfectly, but with some models they use cheaper hardware, and then it's stuff like this. Um, batteries, uh, one thing I hated about the Lego is that they're really picky about rechargeable batteries. I bought like quite expensive, well-known brand uh, rechargeable batteries, but they still didn't work really nice. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. So in the end, I just use normal batteries, but I mean, that's not really good for your environment if you play around all day with them. Um, RFID, it's working, I don't know if you, have any RFID uh, stuff here in the US. In Holland, we have RFID for our public transport. And there, we also have to check in with a card. And if you move uh, next to it too quickly, it doesn't scan. If you have it too far from the scanner, it doesn't work. And it's the same with this one, because it's a really cheap setup. It's like $5 uh, um, RFID readers. If you have more expensive models, they have a, a better range, and they're a bit better. But with this cheap solution, uh, it sometimes doesn't work. Um, Wi-Fi issues at conferences. I mean, I couldn't put this one on my train. It uh, was a bit too heavy. Um, but also, I mean, now you have the new, uh, what is it called, 5 gigahertz bandwidth 
uh, USB dongles, but Raspberry Pi has really poor support for that one. So it's, it's difficult to get uh, those up and running. So you're stuck with the 2.4 gigahertz bandwidth, more or less, or you have to invest a lot of time with it. Um, it's not really plug and play. So it's, it's trying around, fiddling around. I, I've burned quite some stuff like uh, infrared transmitters because cables were connected uh, incorrectly. Um, I saw manuals on the internet that showed the wrong uh, connections. So then you do the same as in the manual and yeah, you break some hardware. Um, I have more or less infinite options and all take some time. Um, the same for the documentation. There, there's a lot available, but when I started, for instance, you had Raspbian on, on a Raspberry Pi, which worked really nice. And all things like sensors and everything else you buy, they, most of the time they have some libraries or some documentation for Raspbian. But I wanted to run Docker on my trains because Docker is also really cool. Um, that's a really good use case, right? Um, <laughs> but Raspbian and Docker with that Raspbian version was really poor. You had to cross compile stuff and everything. And, on the other hand, you also had Arg Linux as a distribution for your Raspberry Pi, but, and that could run Docker like natively. It was super easy to set up. But then all my other stuff wouldn't work because it wasn't really available for Arg Linux. So it's a, it's a bit of fiddling around and, and finding the right solution for your problem. Um, and if you have two small ch children, it's also a challenge if you don't have an extra room. Uh, so sometimes I had to hurry quite quickly before my daughter would uh, trash my trains. But I think the most important uh, challenge was time. I mean, you can build everything, but it, it costs quite some time. And uh, in the beginning, you think, oh, how can it be? I connect some sensors, and I'm done in a weekend, and I can move on. But yeah, I can tell you from my experience, most of the time, it takes more than a weekend. Um, it, I often get the question, how much time did you spend on it? I don't know, and I don't dare to even count it, because then I will probably have some troubles at home. Uh, but it, it's fun, and I mean, it brings you li to places like New York to just talk about your Lego trains. I mean, what's, what's even more better? And what, what we found out, it, it's really, it's appealing to people. It, it's, it's nice and visual, and you can visualize some different concepts with it. And uh, we could prove with it that we could use Scala or Java on a Raspberry Pi, and it would work quite well. And for us as a company, that's, that's important, because we don't do much in IoT business yet, but if we get some IoT projects, we can just use our current knowledge to develop on that platform instead of having to learn our colleagues C or uh, whatever language that is used mostly on uh, IoT hardware. Um, so it, it, it was a bit of a fun project and a, also a bit of uh, yeah, useful knowledge that we gathered along the road. And we, we, we've gathered a lot of knowledge about Scala and Akka as well. And now when we started, we didn't do any customer projects with Scala and Akka, but now we do and we already had some of that knowledge by just playing around with Lego trains. And I can tell you, it's a lot more fun to play with Lego trains than to play with Hello World. It's uh, but the best part, I don't know if all of you already saw the video, but I like it, so I just play it again. But I, in the meantime, are there any questions? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so the question is, did you think about clustering the Raspberry Pi to gain a bit more performance? <laughs> Not for the trains, they're moving way too quickly already and crash uh, all the time if we move at maximum speed. So, um, But we actually, we built a cluster of Raspberry Pis with different Raspberry Pis uh, with an Akka cluster on top of it. So we made a, another uh, example of that. And that works really well. Uh, So for things like this, it's also really useful. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Oh, I see another hand, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Uh, so the question is, the code that's running on the Raspberry Pi, does it look like normal Scala Akka code? Uh, actually, it's really simple Scala Akka code, because uh, underwater, the, 
yeah, I, let's say the difficult stuff is handled by C libraries or Python libraries. So what we do is we simply uh, use actors to receive a message and then use that message to call a C library. So it's, it's a really simple Scala ACA code. It, it's nothing difficult inside it. So we use some di different actors, for instance, actors for the music, actors to control the speed, uh, actors for autopilot. Uh, but it's, it's all quite simple like any other Scala ACA application. Any other questions? Oh, yep. Okay, so the question is, what version of the Raspberry Pi OS did you use? I use Raspberry of Raspbian, and not the newest one, because we started like one and a half years ago. Uh, but you could, uh, I, some while ago, I also implemented it with, I think it was the newest version of Raspbian. And that worked as well, but you have to, some commands you need to change. Uh, because for the infrared transmitter, we use Lurk, the Linux infrared uh, uh, protocol, more or less. Um, but to enable that, you have to enable some kernel modules and stuff like that. And that changed a little bit in the new version of Raspbian. But with a bit of Googling, you can find those things quite easily. So it, it took some time to, to use the new version uh, because you need some new settings. But once you have that up and running, it's, it's quite easy, actually. OK, then thanks all for attending. And enjoy the end of the conference. <laughs>